okay i think this is is happening now sorry getting a little bit to grips with the technology um so hi um anybody who's who's joined um we are there's a new thing that we're doing so um it's going to be um lives it's called who gives a fix and we're going to be um meeting various people um from around the world who are doing interesting stuff in the repair and diy space and um hopefully all getting inspired by the things that they're they're doing um today we're going to get started on this um with a really cool really cool woman called katie tregadon <laughs> hi katie <laughs> Hi. Hey. I'm just going to grips with the technology and just um explain to everyone what we're doing because this whole new thing this um who gives a fix. Um yeah, so we're going to be meeting different people um about once a month and just hearing from um the various kind of stuff that's happening in the repair movement which is a lot actually these days there's loads of stuff going on. Um and yeah, we're getting started with Katie, who is amazing um, writer and thinker in this whole space um, of circular design and sustainability and design. Um, she started out as an interiors blogger, Confessions of a Design Geek, which are just um, joining the dots of all the ways that I know Katie's work. Um, because I think your work, a lot of people will know, but they may not know your name um so uh, it's really cool and so katie's just written this book called wasted which is one thing we're going to talk to her about which is all about um when trash becomes treasure really really interesting stuff and she also wrote this amazing book for anyone who remembers this really cool all us east londoners like get inspired by this all the time um and then she's brought out a new podcast um, called Circular, and the second series is all, we're going to talk to Katie about that as well, so. Hi, Katie. Hi. Where are you today, Katie? I am in Cornwall, in my studio, which is uh, not far from St Ives, that's probably the nearest place Amazing. that people would know. Oh my God. I think everyone's going to be really jealous about that. Have you always lived there? I grew up down here and then sort of did what most Cornish folk do, which was sort of left to seek my fortune, went to university and then lived in London for, gosh, 15, 20 years. Um, and we sort of moved out to Surrey as a bit of a halfway house, thinking we could have a dog and a bit of countryside and still be near to London. But I think that just gave us the taste to come home, really. My husband's from this part of the world as well. So... I think three years ago we moved back here to be closer to the family and close to the sea and have a bit of a better sort of work. I, don't, I hate the phrase work-life balance. A bit of a kind of nicer life, I think, <laughs> which yeah, includes yeah. work. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked back really. Um, but it was, it's been funny because before the pandemic, I sort of kept it on the down low a bit and I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm in London all the time. I'm kind of, yeah, yeah, London, London. And uh, yeah, post-pandemic kind of that shame of not being in London's kind of gone away, hasn't it? Yeah, you're like, yay, I'm not in London. Yeah. <laughs> and yay to be in Cornwall. I mean, that's such an incredibly beautiful part of part of the world. It um, is. Very lucky. Um, so, Katie, I'm like, yeah, shall we, shall we dive into the stuff? I'm just like, I, when I read your um, sort of subtitle on this book, Wasted, um, your question was, can craft save the world? Um, which I think is just a really, really cool question. Um, will you tell us more about that? Like, what do you, what, what is craft for you? And um, yeah, where did the question come from? Yeah, so the question came from, I did a master's um, between 2017 and 2019. It was a part-time two-year course. Um, and I guess I've read about purpose-driven craft and design for about 10 years now. That was what Confessions of a Design Geek was set up to do. Uh, it's what my journalism career's done. It's kind of what I've explored within the context of the books that I've written. So since Makers of East London, there's been Urban Potters and Weaving. And I've always been interested to know what the purpose and the good is within those subjects. But I guess a few years ago, I started to kind of question what I meant by purpose, what I meant by doing good in the world. So went off to do a master's and really allowed myself the first year 
just to paddle about was the expression we used to use, just to kind of explore the terrain. The course kind of parameters were 1850 to 1950. Um, and other than that, it was kind of up to us. Sometimes we were given, you know, you had to pick a material. So, for example, one of the papers we had to either write about plastics or textiles, but we could pick any object within that. So the, the remit was huge. And I just allowed myself to sort of explore and I wrote about feminism I wrote about the plastics crisis I wrote about all sorts of things and then in the summer holidays between the two years and I think that that bit of thinking time away from the pressure of deadlines was so valuable um I sort of thought right I've got to focus in my second year what you know what do I really want to write about what do I want to research and this question can craft save the world popped into my head oh someone's just asked what the MA was it was actually an MST um, and it was the history of design at Oxford University. Um, yeah, this question popped into my head of which was sort of can craft save the world? Because I've always believed in the power of craft and the power of design and the power of making to bring about change. But we're sort of facing this huge existential crisis at the moment, aren't we? In the, in the form of climate change and biodiversity loss and kind of all these interconnected problems that are sort of threatening our demise as a species. And I was sort of like, well, if I really believe in craft and design, can it? You know, and obviously it's not going to solve all of those problems, but has it got a role to play? And the question, can craft save the world, is sort of deliberately provocative. I think people who don't know a lot about craft would probably laugh and say, well, of course it can't. Um, and that's kind of the point, is to sort of engage people and, and think, oh, well, can it? Really? What do you mean by craft? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess and that was the question you asked me, is what do I mean by craft? Yeah. Um, and I think I'm interested in the power of making with our hands. Um, and I think it's interesting that Glenn Adamson <clears throat> says that it's not that women and people of colour practice craft. It's that whatever women and people of colour practice, we call it craft. And it's almost been like a, since the Industrial Revolution, there's been a, a sort of attempt to marginalise and minimise craft and, and hand making and i think it's interesting that women and people of color are the same groups that are disproportionately affected by climate change they're the same groups that are being left out of the climate change debate so the government's initial lineup of negotiators for cop 26 was all male the uk government um and you know when you're close to the problem you're close to the solution so i'm really interested in this idea that there's this group of people who are you know, disproportionately female and disproportionately people of colour, although of course there are white male craftsmen, <laughs> yeah. um, who make with their hands and have this power. And I think craft is tremendously powerful. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can all learn from the inherently circular practices that exist within craft. So I guess that's what I'm kind of starting to explore in this book. My intention is this will be the first of many books ex exploring this topic. And, and the use of waste as a raw material is only a tiny part of the circular economy. So it's by no means you know, a silver bullet solution that's going to solve all the problems. But I think it's interesting to start thinking about the ways that mending and making and kind of having the personal agency that comes with having hand skills can start to bring about change. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Katie, that, uh, I think that's it's super interesting. Just the, um, I mean, it's just so, that's such a rich kind of topic. I'm just kind of wondering, like, where, <laughs> like, the um the making and just the diversity of what you mean by craft and that the closeness to materials and stuff mm -hmm. um and like i love your your kind of definition of, of craft where you're talking about it can be any kind of making getting close to materials because i think there's something um uh about repair that is about getting hands-on and this kind of idea of um like although our challenges with I guess just developing our consciousness and what we can do um, to reduce waste and what we can do um, as part of the climate movement as like little individuals with our tiny lives and we're particularly on something on a planetary scale. Um, sometimes, you know, and especially for us, like we, you know, sugar is all about, um, um, you know, we, we want to kind of like have a, a larger movement and it is, it is quite like a, a 
a large community of people now that are repairing with Sugru and stuff. Um, but like, you know, there's, there's definitely this tension between like our tiny kind of little actions of saving one little teapot or saving one little toy train or whatever it is, these tiny actions and the kind of enormity of, I guess, the challenge. Um, um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, shall we, shall we just explore that a little bit? Um, you know, how do you see that? Um, uh, yeah, like can it make a difference that we fix things? And is that something you're exploring in your um, repair podcast? Yeah, yeah. So the next season of the podcast is going to be all about repair. The, the first season was all about waste and kind of, well, I suppose not even just making things from waste because the fun thing about a podcast is you can, it's kind of an open brief. So when I'm writing books and articles, obviously I've got, kind of got to stay on brief. I've got to stay on topic. But the, the challenge I set myself with the podcast was to pick a theme and then interview people from every possible angle on that theme so we get quite tangential and quite metaphorical at times but that's kind of the joy so the first series was all about waste and the next series which i'm hoping will launch mid-may ish i was saying spring wasn't i i'm now getting a little bit more pinned down to mid-may um it's going to be all about repair um and that's something we've very much been exploring in the conversations i've been having with everybody from jay blades who who presents the repair shop on the bbc to uh, Celia Pym, who uses darning as an art form, to Justin South, who is a recovering drug and alcohol addict who has used furniture restoration as part of his recovery. So I've kind of got this amazingly diverse bunch of people. And one of the things we've been talking about, obviously, is what is the role of repair in the circular economy? And it's really important, right? The second tenet of the circular economy, as defined by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is to keep objects and materials in use. And one of the main ways you do that is by repairing them. Um, and so I think there's an awful lot we can do as individual humans. And I also think if you care about this stuff, you've kind of got to live in a way that is aligned with your values. So I think it's, it's important. But I think more than that, I think we need systemic change you know there was an interesting um note in i don't know who's seen seaspiracy the netflix documentary which was you know criticized and you know slightly problematic in some ways but the, nevertheless a very interesting documentary and one of the points that one of the people made is as individuals you and i can go pescatarian if we uh, sorry can stop being pescatarian and go vegetarian if we disagree with this stuff but our taxes are still subsidizing the fishing industry. So there's only a certain amount of impact we can have as individual humans. And one of the stats that horrified me when I was researching Wasted was that for every sack of rubbish you or I put out on the curbside, 70, 70 sacks of waste have been generated by the processes that led to the products that have ended up in that bag. So we can sort of imagine that we're one seventieth of the problem when it comes to waste. So of course we can do all we can to keep stuff out of that one bag, mm. but really we've got to start pushing up the chain and we've got to be influencing big businesses and governments. But I think when you start mending things, when you start taking care of your own carbon footprint and sustainability sort of impact as it were you get more engaged you understand how things are made you work out what some of those bigger systemic problems are and that's when you start going to marches writing to your mp complaining to manufacturers that their thing is not fixable you know so i i think i really believe in personal agency and and i think it's a way into us starting to campaign for some of those bigger systemic changes which ultimately are the only thing that are going to move the needle yeah, I think that is super, super kind of um, interesting how you kind of um, connecting the the different kind of um, levels at which change needs to happen. And clearly, you know, the, the biggest change that needs to happen, you know, we need to like change the system so that we're using renewable energy. We need to like, you know, change how we how we live. But the connections that can be made by living in a way where we are um repairing things reusing things um you know making sure that we're part of a sharing economy that isn't driving demand for for new things there's so many ways um that people are creatively finding within their own lives which i think 
also just like develop our consciousness, like you're saying, like of of the system and what like the implications of what what change really means. Um, I think there's also like just something really um, cool, which I've learned from the Suga community um, about repair as well, is um, just, I guess, the emotional rewards as well. Like, you know, like when we have such a huge challenge and we're living in kind of daunting times, um, like taking tiny actions um, is also a way of like getting, making progress or like mm. feeling some kind of progress and some rewards like the kind of satisfaction of not only saving something that you care about or whatever, but also the learning process that goes with that. That's also like just, um, I, I guess it's part of the creativity and the rewards of, of doing creative stuff and, um, and, and learning with your hands, learn, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a quite yeah, immersive think... um, experience where you can kind of feel that you're taking action and making progress um, yeah. as I'm a part of a wider thing. And the other thing I've really, like, like I'm so, like, love about the super community is that they share their fixes as well. So, like, I think there is also just something, even though they're tiny, tiny little actions that each of us are individually fixing a shoe or fixing a radio or whatever it is, by sharing it, you also do have influence on our shared culture and and the sense that like there's a kind of a grassroots um i suppose a grassroots kind of swell of people yeah. that care and people that are going to like you know um you know i guess really try to change things and that we can there's power in numbers as well yeah. and just kind of pos yeah, positivity in a world where like it can be quite daunting yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's actually a wonderful podcast called How to Save a Planet. And, um, yes, I love that. It's so good. There's an episode, which I believe is called Is Your Carbon Footprint BS? But they take this idea of kind of personal changes and systemic changes and kind of put them up against each other and look at the science and sort of say, look, which one is more effective? Is there any point us worrying about individual things? And the conclusion they came to was that the, the real power in the individual actions is in sharing them and inspiring other people to do the same. So I think, you know, from that point of view, platforms like Instagram can be so powerful and you've only got to look at the kind of proliferation of the hashtag visible mending kind of hashtag on Instagram, which I think has got 100,000 posts on it or more. Um, and looking at that idea of, <clears throat> of celebrating, you know, visible mends and, you know, that in itself can be problematic. That's not available or an option for everybody. Um, but it's just interesting to see how these things start to become contagious and start to bring about sort of shifts in the culture, which is what we need. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, Katie, I, I wanted to ask you about something I, I, that I, I read um, that you uh, said recently about repair and the language of repair and how like so, sometimes we use the word mending and sometimes mm. we use the word repair. Um, we as Sugru, we, we kind of have explored using various ones and we, we tend to use like all of them, but more fixing more generally as a kind of like um, kind of catch all. But yeah, will you tell us about, about that and like the different uses of the words and um, yeah. Yeah, so this is something I actually explore in some depth with Bridget Harvey on the podcast. So oh, definitely Bridget. seek out that episode when it comes mm -hmm. out. But it's interesting because there are there are slight definitional differences in terms of whether you are restoring something back to new or whether you're restoring the function of it or kind of. But interestingly, I have noticed that the word mending tends to be associated with women. It tends to be associated with unpaid labor and it tends to be associated with textiles. The word repair tends to be associated with men, tends to be associated with hard materials like wood and electronics and is more likely to be associated with paid labor, not always, but more likely. Um, and then you've got other words like kind of hacking is another word which comes up and, and that's about kind of not just a, a repair, but actually giving something new functionality. And so I think it's really interesting that there are all these different words for effectively the same bunch of stuff. You know, if you're, if you're darning a hole in a jumper, you're kind of doing the same thing as if you're fixing a, a leaky teapot, you know, but they're, they're gendered, you know, they have different value weightings. 
um, and there are words that some people are really comfortable with their work or their practice being described as and other people are kind of not comfortable with those words so I think there's um there's an awful lot of kind of social and cultural weight within all this stuff and one of the things I actually looked at in my dissertation was whether mending could ever go mainstream and I looked at the cultural and class appropriation of mending techniques so the fact that mending often comes out of poverty it often comes out of lack and is often done really for necessity or historically that's certainly been the case whereas now often people are mending things when they could quite easily afford to buy a new one they don't want to they're either mending that object for sustainability reasons or for sentimental reasons and there's an element of privilege that comes with that choice with the you know the time and the care and the attention that they're able to give to that process um and so i think there's some interesting stuff in there as well you know if you have to wear a uniform to work you probably can't have a visible darn as a badge of honor you know and even people who wear visible darns in certain circumstances perhaps wouldn't wear one to go to a doctor's appointment or to go to a job interview and so i'm really interested in the sort of the class implications the cultural implications the gender implications kind of all the complexity that exists with it it's not as simple as just saying right everybody needs to mend and it'll all be fine mm -hmm. you've got you've really got to kind of unpick all these strings of complexities and implications that come with um, amended objects um, before you can get to something that will ever be able to be a, a kind of broad sweeping solution that is available to a lot of people. Uh, so I find all of that stuff fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> totally so fascinating. It's one of those kind of like crazy rabbit holes. It's like, you know, if you look at anything for long enough, you'll... <laughs> Yeah, twenty thousand words so I got out of that stuff. <laughs> interesting stuff. I guess that's the life of a writer. Um, here, so let's just um, like t tell me about um, the the repair podcast because um, uh, we'll definitely want to um, tell um, the super community all about that and like how to find it and what they can look forward to and stuff. Um, t tell us like what's um, yeah, what tell us a story or something that like we can look forward to in the podcast yeah so if, the, if people want to find it probably the best thing to do is go to whichever podcast platform you use whether it's spotify apple podcasts whatever it is and search for circular with katie triggerton if you spell my name right it'll come up top if you don't it'll probably be in there somewhere and if you subs the, the wasted series is there already so i think there's nine or ten episodes um that you can listen to but if you hit subscribe it means when the repair series lands you will get that first or if you follow me on instagram um, or sign up for my e-newsletter or, or whatever, you'll see it for sure. Um, but yeah, that will be coming mid-May-ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no um, worries. We're all relaxed, but we're looking forward to it. <laughs> it's me that's not. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I know you've got some amazing people and stuff because you've mentioned Celia Pym and Jay Blades and stuff. So, yeah, so yeah. we've got um, 14 episodes, uh, one of which is a panel event that I chaired a couple of years ago and I just stuck my dictaphone on just in case it was useful. So if the sound quality is good enough, I'm going to share that as a bonus episode. And that was an amazing conversation between Bridget Harvey, Celia Pym, Justin South and Chris Miller, who runs Skinflint, which is a lighting restoration company. Mm. So that will be a, a sort of bonus episode. Um, and then I've done, I think, or will have done 13 interviews with everybody from artists who use repair in their practice. So there's an amazing artist called Aya Haydar, who um, takes photographs of cities that have been damaged during wars. So sort of uh, bomb damage on, on buildings and she embroiders into them to sort of metaphorically repair that damage. And then she also does workshops with refugees who fled those war zones. And I think that's a really beautiful way to look at repair as a as a metaphor for for healing. Um, so that conversation was amazing. Um, Jay, I chatted. I've known Jay for a long time, so he had a good long chat about his whole story and kind of how he ended up at the repair shop and how that yeah, program came about. Because the repair shop has been such an amazing success story. Yeah. I mean, like when we started out, like with repair and seeing group, oh, what is this or whatever. Whereas like now it's like mainstream tv and he's, he's yeah. done such amazing work 
And it's fascinating because he was sort of saying on paper, it shouldn't work. Like people bring their stuff to get mended and get this mended and <laughs> give it back to them. Like, how is that a TV yeah, show? Yeah. But what's interesting about it is it's all about those stories, right? And I think, I think storytelling is such an important part of moving towards a culture that is more accepting of repair. So I think in the 20th century, we've kind of, we've had this veneration of newness, this idea that when we buy something, it's perfect. And the moment we take it out of the box, it starts deteriorating. And that perception is dangerous, you know, whereas if we can, um, Kate Fletcher write, writes beautifully about the craft of use and this idea that when we buy something, it's a blank canvas, it's empty, it's lifeless. And then the moment we take it out of the box, we start layering on our stories. Oh my God, I love that idea. It's beautiful. She talks about clothes and the idea that, you know, the creases in the elbows are sort of when an item of clothing starts to come to life. And I think if we can start to see objects like that, and um, I interviewed Bonnie Kempsky the other day, who is an academic who specialises in kintsugi, the sort of Japanese art of of restoring things with gold. And um, I, I think we've got to be really careful. You know, I've talked about this idea of the cultural appropriation of mending techniques. So I think we've got to be really careful when we extract things from another culture and bring them into the West. But talking to Bonnie, who knows an awful lot about this, there is a sense of the kind of stories of those objects being really important and the sense that once something's been mended, it becomes more valuable because of that that kind of fracture, how that happened, and then the fact it's been it's been healed and, and elevated. And they use gold, you know, it's kind of the, the object physically becomes more valuable. And so I think it's really interesting to look at the sort of the pattern of stories that objects acquire over time. And I think okay. that shift in thinking is a really interesting way to keep objects in use to yeah, go back yeah. to the, the I, circle I, of I love economy. I love that idea. We like we we have it with houses, we have it with um streets, you know, old is better. We have it with um you know, we love the kind of patina and like the history and stuff. We love it with like wood, like it gets better with age. Um and I I yeah, I think that's like just it's, it's super, super nice to think about it with clothes, which I can see actually probably is something that people could could kind of really kind of take that on because of definitely the memories and stuff when you wore it and all that sort of stuff. But then to like bring it into everyday stuff, like which is really where the kind of Sioux group mm. community really sits in. Like we would often hear that like about, um, you know, a, a certain teapot or a certain pair of flip flops or yeah. whatever that people just can consider like, and they might not have even been expensive, but that they just considered them treasures um and part of their kind of treasures because of the memories and then the fact then that you have repaired it and put that sort of your own stamp or mm. your your stories and your kind of values and commitment are kind mm. of like embedded and in there with the repair is like there's a sense of of love my sister all my family now think I can repair stuff, which I really can't. <laughs> you know, I've kind of, I did a master's and wrote a book, guys. The hand skills are lacking. But I, I kind of always try to, to learn things with my hands as well as my head. So I will always go and, you know, at least do a short course so I've got the hand skills to go with what I'm thinking about. And so my sister sent me her favourite top, which, you know, was not an expensive top. It's come from a, a high street brand who shall remain nameless. Um, and it's absolutely full of holes. And she was just like, is there anything you can do with this? And I was just like how do you still even own this um and I kind of own, I, I can't darn I've tried to learn repeatedly and I'm very bad at it the only thing I can do is kind of the, the sort of buttonholing effect so all you do is neaten the edges of the hole and the hole stays there um but I did that with a with a contrasting color um and I was just amazed by it felt like such an act of love you know and such an act of care and I haven't seen my sister for a long time because of lockdown and you know we're really close and it, I just found it really, I was surprised. I thought this was going to be a job I was going to do for my sister, you know, so yeah, fine. And I, just, I was sat there sewing, just feeling really quite moved. And I ended up stitching a little message in the, uh, you oh. know, the washing instruction label for her um, and sent it back. And she now says she loves it even more than she did when it was new. So, oh, but I was, I was Katie, just struck so, by that, that kind of that, that 
love and that care that comes within mending an object you know it was a it was a cheap top it was nothing special but because it meant something to her it meant something to me and it was yeah I was I was really moved by the whole experience that is so cool so so cool and and I am actually going to end on that note because it is so cool <laughs> <laughs> I love it repair equals love um Thank you so much, Katie. And um, we will share like the various links and stuff and hopefully yeah. we'll get all the super community signing and subscribing to your pop podcast. And yeah, all the very best of luck with it. And we can't wait to hear it and stuff. And I guess talk to you soon. Amazing. Thank you so much for having Thanks me. Thanks so much. Bye, Katie. Bye.